Hello everyone and welcome to section 2 of the reliability and validity topic. Okay, we are going to jump straight in um, with explaining, assessing and improving validity. Here we go. So where reliability was a measure of consistency, validity is much more a measure of legitimacy. So it's looking at whether an observed effect is genuine and actually represents what is actually out there in the real world. For example, a working set of scales that accurately represents weight if they work, if they're not broken. Okay. Um, now you've got two different types of validity. You've got internal validity and you've got external validity. And I'm going to go off on a tangent now. I'm just going to quickly explain what each of these are, even though I'm assuming that you know this already, but I'm just going to make sure. So internal validity is whether the effects that have been observed are due to the manipulation of the IV. So am I measuring what I say I'm measuring? It's very, very important because there are other things that can come up in a study that can affect what it is that you're measuring. Okay. Um, for example, demand characteristics. Demand characteristics are a massive impact or can have a massive impact on the internal validity. For example, in Milgram's study, where some of the participants thought said that they didn't really believe that the, st that the electric shocks were real and they were just doing what they thought they were supposed to do. So at that point, you're not actually measuring obedience anymore. Okay. External validity, however, relates much more to factors outside of the investigation, such as generalizing to other settings, populations, and eras or periods of time. So ecological validity, for example, concerns generalizing findings from one setting to another setting, particularly to everyday life, as that is what psychologists are interested in studying. Very importantly here, it's not about how natural the study is. People often think that um, a study done in a natural environment means that the ecological validity is better. That's not true, not always anyway. A more natural setting doesn't mean there's going to be higher ecological validity. Um, it does play a part, but it's actually much more about the realism of the task um, used to measure the dependent variable. So if you think back to uh, lessons in memory, for example, very often a criticism of memory is that people use artificial tasks or artificial stimuli. Now, if you change those artificial stimuli, like, I don't know, remembering a list of words... If you change that to something a little bit more relevant and a little bit more real life, like recognizing faces, then your task becomes a little bit more realistic and therefore your ecological validity can go up, whether you're doing it in a lab or whether you're doing it somewhere in a natural setting. Okay, That's called mundane realism. Okay, you need to have high levels of mundane realism in order to increase your ecological validity. Then you've also got another one called temporal validity, and that is the issue as whether or not findings from a particular study hold true over time. And again, I'll give you an example of Ash's study. One of the biggest evaluation points of Ash's study is that it's a child of its time, and that it was done in the 50s when people were very, very conformist anyway. And actually, if you did it again in the 80s, like Perrin and Spencer did, for example, you might find that actually less people conform. So that's temporal validity. Does it hold true over time? Okay, so moving on, as a final point, studies and measures can be reliable but not valid. 
So if you take a set of broken kitchen scale, scales into account, you can say, right, my broken kitchen scales are going to reliably give me the same measure over and over again. However, it's going to be wrong. Um, so it's going to be invalid. Or with IQ tests, somebody who knows how an IQ test works, if you give them an IQ test, are you measuring their IQ or are you just measuring how familiar they are with an IQ test? So again, internal validity, am I measuring what I say I'm measuring? Okay, so how do we assess validity? This one is fairly simple. You've got two different options. You've got something called face validity, and that is a very simple way of assessing the validity of something, and that is, does it look good? So if I want to do a questionnaire on stress, and I give my questionnaire to somebody and say, does this questionnaire look like it's asking people about how stressed they are? And somebody looks it over and they say, yes, you're asking a lot of questions about how stressed people are. It looks good. It has good face validity. Now, my other option is concurrent validity. And that is, I take my questionnaire on stress and I compare it to an already established stress questionnaire. So I can give my participants my stress questionnaire and then I can give them a, an already existing widely recognized stress questionnaire that is used clinically all the time and if the two results are similar then I can go ahead and assume that my study or that my questionnaire has good concurrent validity okay so final little bit then how do we improve our validity of a study now bearing in mind these are very very popular questions in research methods sections of papers um, you're often given a study and then somewhere down the line down the line they ask you how could the researchers assess the reliability? How could they assess the validity? How could they improve the validity? Okay. So, for experimental research, using a control group means that we're able to assess the changes in the dependent variable were actually due to the effect of the independent variable. So, for example... In a study looking at the effectiveness of a particular therapy, having a control group that didn't receive the therapy means that the researcher can have greater confidence that any improvement seen in the experimental condition was actually due to the effects of the therapy because he's got something to compare it to. We also use standardization of procedures because that minimizes the impact of participant reactivity and investigator effects. It means that researchers don't ask questions in a certain way or they don't change the way that they run the study or the phrasing of their instructions and all that kind of stuff. And it also means that participants don't react to the investigator as much because everybody gets the same instructions in exactly the same way, in exactly the same place, at the same time, etc., etc. Researchers also use single and double blind procedures to achieve the same aim. So you might remember from your research methods lessons in the past that a single blind procedure means that participants don't know the aims of the study until they've taken part. And a double blind study means that a third party actually conducts the investigation. A third party who doesn't know the aims or the purpose of the research and therefore can't have an impact on the findings um, either way. Okay, so they're ways of improving the validity of experimental research. 
if you're using questionnaires, many questionnaires and psychological tests actually incorporate lie scales within the questions in order to assess the consistency of participants' responses and also to control for the effects of social desirability bias. They could also in further enhance the validity of questionnaires by ensuring that respondents know that all data submitted will remain anonymous. If participants know that their information that they're giving is going to be kept confidential and that no information about them or no personal information about them is going to be collected, then they're more likely to act naturally and answer questions honestly. So that's another way of improving validity. Moving on to observational research, observations very often produce findings that have quite high ecological validity as there may be minimal intervention by the researcher. That's especially the case in covert observations where the observer actually remains undetected. That means that the behavior of those people that are being observed is more likely to be natural and authentic because the researcher isn't getting involved. You've also got the issue of behavioral categories. If they are too broad, if they overlap, or if they're ambiguous, that could have a negative impact on the validity of the data collected. So you need to make sure that your behavioral categories are properly operationalized before you start any observational research. And then, as a final one, if you are conducting qualitative um, research, you might find that this type of research is usually considered as having higher ecological validity than more quantitative and less interpretive methods of research. Now that's because people often think that because I've got that depth and that detail associated with things like case studies and interviews, it means that it better reflects the participant's reality. However, the researcher still needs to demonstrate the interpretive validity of their conclusions. Now that means they need to show the extent to which their own interpretation of events matches the interpretation of the participants. So have they reported what the participant intended to show or to say? Because if they haven't, then they're lacking validity again. So that can be demonstrated through such things as how coherent is the reporting of the research. They can also include direct quotes from participants within the report as well. You can also further enhance your validity when you're doing qualitative research by using something called triangulation. That, that means you're using a number of different sources as evidence. For example, data compiled through interviews with friends and family, personal diaries, observations, and so on and so on. The more sources of information that you have when you do qualitative research, the more your data is going to be triangulated and the more valid your findings are going to be. Okay, so I hope that's all made sense. We're now coming towards the end of the video and there's been a lot of stuff that I've gone through in this one. So I'm hoping that I didn't rush through too quickly. Um, obviously go back and have another little look at certain bits if you think you missed something. Um, just remember, this stuff often comes up in re research methods sections in papers. Okay, so the the most popular way I've seen it, I've seen it come up is, for example, um, how can the researchers assess the reliability of their study? Um, suggest one way in which the researchers could improve the validity of their study. Um, explain what is meant by validity in relation to the above study. That kind of thing. Okay, so make sure that you have the information on reliability and validity locked down tight because, like I say, they 
are very popular questions to ask. Okay, so I hope this has been useful, and thank you very much for listening.